It starts out, for this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. So Lord, as we come in worship this morning, we just ask that you would come today, Father, and inhabit our praises that you would fill this place with your presence. Father, Jesus, and Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and be guest of honor today. Just to glorify you and to praise you that we're going to stand and join together in song today. And so I, I just invite you, Lord God, to come and inhabit our praises. In Jesus' name, amen.
and tell them how awesome they look with the love of God all over them. <laughs> it's good to see you all this morning. I just want to quick, I'm going to do this before and after so I don't forget. If you haven't filled out one of the Connect cards, the new Connect cards we have, uh, Floyd will be in the back uh, by the tech booth there, or maybe out front with a handful of them. We're just trying to update our, our database, keep everybody connected, let you know what's going on, et cetera. If you're new here, uh, I know I talked to some of you about that, about filling out a Connect card. We're not going to try and sell you a bunch of stuff, I promise, just to keep you informed if you have questions and things like that. Amen? I'm, I'm a little nervous about this today. This is something that's been on my heart for a good while. And, and I hope it comes across in a meaningful way for you that's easy to understand. You know, over the past few months, in particular the last three or four weeks, my heart's just been exploding in pursuit of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I've been so hungry for so long for the more with him. I'm not content to stay in the space that I've been in. I want more. You know, in the last few weeks here, his, the tenderness and gentleness that we feel when he comes close has been amazing. Have you felt it? Particularly during worship, you can feel the presence of God and it's Honestly, all I've been able to do in worship the last several weeks is weep, and that's not like me. His touch has been so awesome, and it's gone beyond Sunday mornings. I'm waking up in the morning now, and I've got songs in my head and in my heart. Just this morning, I woke up singing in my heart, what a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus, right? Have you been feeling it? I think it's this newness that we're going to experience. And, and my heart and my desire to fellowship has reached a new level. And I don't ever want to go back to the way I was doing it before. Right? It was stale. A lot of that's my fault. Right? And I believe for this church and for each individual here that what lies ahead of us in our relationship with him is far, far greater and is going to be far more fulfilling and powerful than what we left behind. And so today I want to talk to you a little bit about pursuing the more. Talk on it. And it's way down there now. <laughs> two weeks ago, Jim Reimer came and he talked to us out of the story of the wedding at Cana in John chapter 2. And there's something that came out of that that's just struck me. It's really struck me. How many of you read a red letter Bible? You know what I'm talking about? Everything Jesus says is in red, right? Yeah, I do too. And there's a, if we're not careful, there's a trap we can fall into of skipping by the words in black and white to get to the stuff in red. Let's face it, that's what comes out of Jesus' mouth, right? That's the good stuff. In the wedding story, there are five words spoken that I've read several hundred times, and it wasn't until here just recently that I actually saw them. When I say saw them, they hit my heart, and I accepted what was being said in the passage. And I feel like those five words are the key to open a door for us into the more with Jesus. So let's set that story up a little bit. If you want to open your Bible to John chapter 2, we're not going to go over the verses but you can just look at the story and refamiliarize yourself. Jesus and the disciples have been invited to this wedding at Cana. And immediately, there's a change in the story. And Mary comes to Jesus and she lays this problem at his feet. Not literally, but figuratively. They are out of wine. And this is a huge problem for this family involved. Because what they are facing down is lifelong shame. Not in the context that we understand it today where someone shames you on social media. I'm talking about real, a real burden to carry. In the ancient times, there's an honor-shame lever that's being pulled all the time. You can see it in Scripture. 
you see the man comes and he approaches Jesus. Good teacher. And then he asks a question, right? You remember this? What's Jesus respond? Why do you call me good? There is none good but the Father. And in this transaction, the man is approaching Jesus and honoring him, expecting to be honored in return, therefore getting his status elevated. And Jesus didn't happen, it, is he? There's none good but the Father. And in this case, everyone involved in the planning of this wedding is going to be shamed. It's going to be a big problem. Sounds like today, doesn't it? There was and is limited honor. But for some reason, there's unlimited shame. That's a story for another day, though. Let's not talk about that. And Jesus tries to explain to his mother, it's not my time to be revealed as the Messiah. And he does not reveal himself publicly as such, does he? But Mary utters five words that change the trajectory of this story and the trajectory of this honor-shame quotient that's involved. And if we apply them in our lives, we will see a change in our spiritual, physical, mental, emotional, financial trajectories as well. She tells the servants, whatever he says, do it. Julie and I were talking the other night, and she said, you could have ended the Bible right there. Just jokingly, of course. But think about all the stuff that follows helps us position ourselves to do exactly that, doesn't it? To follow and obey what he says. And I I know folks get hung up about that word, obedience. We'll talk about that in a little bit here. Jim's explanation of what took place was awesome, in my opinion. Even a little bit amusing. I think it's the best preaching I've heard on the topic, if I haven't said that already. And as we wonder what these servants were thinking, you just have to know they were looking at each other like, is this guy serious? Put water in these water pots? But there was so much more involved in it than that, wasn't there? Let's begin with expectations. The question could be asked, were the servants in doubt about what they should be doing? I bet they were. No question. Were they in doubt about taking a picture of what they hoped would be good tasting wine to the chief steward? I bet they were. Because it's a big risk, isn't it? It's so unknown for them. And as I was looking at it the other day, something popped into my head. I'm going to frame it to you like this. Don't expect answered prayers if you're not willing to follow the instructions you receive. All right? It's going to stretch you. It may even sound too strange to believe. And obedience is a word we get hung up on. So let's put it this way. Don't expect answered prayers if you're not willing to come into agreement with what the Father says. Amen? What's the expectation of the chief steward? It says right in the text, doesn't it? He expects it's later in the feast. Everybody's had plenty to drink. They're going to bring out the cheap stuff, right? I don't know anything about wine. I know there's red wine, there's white wine. So some total of my knowledge. It's not something I'm particularly, it's it's not important to me. And I'm willing to bet that in that region, there were only a handful of different kinds of grapes to make wine from. But the chief steward, he knows wine, doesn't he? He's probably done lots and lots of feasts like this. You don't become chief steward unless you've worked your way up the ranks, right? Makes sense to me. Man, this thing's driving me nuts. When it comes to wine, I mean, I I know there's wine in boxes, wine in bottles, but the chief steward has tasted good wine, and he knows what to expect, and his expectation is is it's going to be bad or lesser of a lesser vintage. Let's put it that way. But what's Mary's expectation? She wasn't looking to the old way of things, was she? She had a much, much greater expectation on Jesus, and she believed that he could and would help, and he did. As Jim described it, it came out in tremendous abundance. And beyond just the production of this wonderful tasting wine, the chief steward says it's the best wine he's ever tasted. This is a new wine. Because he probably would have tasted 
pretty much everything that was available, right? This is new wine. Not only in tremendous abundance, but he took away this shame that this family was facing down and he replaced it with incredible honor because a steward recognized him for it, correct? It was going to be a great shame, but it turned around and he did something phenomenal with it. And how many times, just ask a question here, how many of you have turned to Jesus with a problem? You've laid it at his feet and said, will you help me? And he's helped you. Hmm? Yeah. Let's give him a clap offering for that, huh? Because that's what he does. You know, a long time ago, I'm going to share a little bit of my personal testimony with you. In 2006, Julie and I went to Honduras on our very first mission trip. It was a week-long gig, and we're in country in this, uh, their base camp is in the northern part of the country. And the first morning there, we have breakfast, and we hike up on this mountain, and the director there, he starts telling us all about the ministry, and he's showing us this and showing us that. And it's really a pretty place. It's kind of like Jurassic Park scene, you know, without the killing animals. And he tells us, you know, you came here expecting to see Jesus do something, didn't you? You expect to learn something about yourself. But I also believe that you came here to leave a little something behind, something that you're tired of carrying around. And so what I want you to do is pick up a rock, and then I want you to, and I'll do this in my, how I would say it, I want you to go someplace and do business with Jesus. And so I walked off to a place right by myself, and I stood there, and I looked at the rock, and I said, Jesus, I'm tired of being an angry man. Tired of walking around with this bitterness and resentment in me. I'm going to put my anger on that rock, and I don't ever want to see it again. And I'd like to ask you to come in and peel off these layers off my heart that are crusty and dead and put something in there that's beautiful. I'd really appreciate it if you'd hook that up. Your pal, Greg. And I threw my rock off the mountain, and that was it. We went back home later. A few months later, I'm in my office, and I have a tactical nuke explode. It's a huge problem. And I call my team together, like, you guys go down to marketing, tell them what we did. You guys go down to accounting, tell them we're going to have to crew for the expenses in this problem. And you and I, we're going to go clean up the mess. And a few hours later, I'm sitting there at my desk, and I'm typing out this memo to my boss, and I pause. Why am I not seething with anger right now? Huh. Thanks, Jesus. And I went back a year later, and I said, will you take my pride? And I did it all over again. Ironically, I said, Jesus, will you, will you take my pride? Well, I bet I can throw this rock way down there. <laughs> but he does. And the impact that Jesus makes in this situation goes far beyond the sign or miracle it's performed, doesn't it? And if we talk about a sign, is it, make sure we understand what that means. A sign points beyond itself to something greater. In this case, the sufficiency and supremacy of Jesus Christ. The creation miracle is a manifestation of that sign that validates his supremacy and sufficiency. And what he does is he creates a new wine, doesn't he? It's never been tasted, never been experienced. Nonetheless, it's a new wine. And that's what I want us to think about today as we go along. You're going to hear me repeat that expression a lot. See, new wine has been used as a metaphor for the Holy Spirit. We saw that last Sunday was Pentecost Sunday. New wine's a metaphor for the Holy Spirit, God's outpouring on humanity. It's also been used as a derisive term in the exact same story. They're drunk on new wine, right? And I think that's ironic. If we're going to say that new wine equals an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, then technically, yeah. They were intoxicated with the goodness that they had received from God. Not, not in the literal sense, but they were hungry for what God was going to do. And they began to pour it out. Did they not? See, new wines weigh different. 
New wine is different. It requires different thinking, different acting, different vision. And a little bit of it creates an appetite to see the impossible done. You know, last week, Floyd was talking about a new move of God, right? And I think his message was incredible last week. And one of the things that really hit Julie and I, like so many believers, is we expect God to come in and do his thing, and it's going to be in the exact same way as it was last time. Right? How many? You expect, you go there, expect to see it. Same way. But God's on the move, isn't he? I try and manage my time in his wake. I want to follow where he's going, but sometimes I get lazy. And I veer off over here on my own, doing my own thing, right? How many people have ever read the little book, Who Moved My Cheese? What a great little read, isn't it? It's all about how we deal with change. There's two mice and two little people. And the two mice keep one of them in particular. And I'm going to use him as an example in the story. Because this mouse, the cheese has been moved, but he goes right back to that same spot every morning looking for his cheese. Day after day after day. While the other mouse scurries about trying to find new cheese. Who found cheese? The one that looked about. And one of the things I want you to think about here is how many of you have gone back to the place you've been with God and expect him to be there doing the exact same things, revealing the exact same thoughts to you, giving you the exact same things to pray about? Liam, will you put up that first picture? Please and thank you. See, what I think happens is so many people, when we become new believers, we get into this nice little spot in the river with Jesus, right? And we sit there and we splash and play and it's safe and it's comfortable and I know everything about it, but Jesus is calling me continually to come out here deeper. I don't like rivers, especially outside. They're all muddy. And I know I can see right here it's still shallow, but then it drops off and maybe there's stuff down there that's going to hurt me. Maybe there's jagged rocks or broken glass or something that would eat me. I'm afraid to go. And so what do we do? We retreat back to here. This is where Jesus was last time. I'm going to wait. And that's what that picture says. We experienced God in this place in the past, and so I'm going to continue to come right back there and wait on him again. And then things in the present, ooh, we had a change at the beginning of the year. Now my future isn't so familiar and secure, is it? There's change going on. I'm going to retreat back to where I was most comfortable. I'm never growing there, am I? I'm staying the same. Liam, will you hit that other one now, please? And thank you. This picture is a little bit of a different representation of the same thing. Most of us as believers, we stay in that red spot, don't we? The comfort zone. I sit there. I, everything's familiar. It's like when I led mission teams. Two questions that I knew I was going to get. Two questions, the same questions every time. These are things that people are afraid of. What's the food going to be like? And what's the bathroom going to be like? Because we can sleep anywhere, right? But Jesus is calling us out further. And we get into that orange zone. That's where the real fear is, isn't it? That I don't know what's there. If I step off, I, I don't want to step off. So um, I'm going to start making excuses as to why I have to stay there. I don't have confidence to move forward into that space that he's calling me into. But eventually he calls you and calls you and calls you till you finally you take a step and you go out there into the learning zone. I have spiritual gifts? What the heck is that? I, I actually like people. <laughs> I didn't know I ever did that. I love people. That's real healing for me. 
but I have this, these gifts and these different things and new skills that I acquire, and now my comfort zone is expanding. So pretty soon, I'm stepping out there in faith, and I'm talking to somebody on the street I've never met. Can I tell you about my friend Jesus? And now I'm growing. And that's how we all continue to grow. We get better. We take the challenge. We don't retreat back over here to where everything was known and comfortable and safe. Who wants some of that? But something else the past, present, future picture represents, for those of you that have hesitation about what I'm saying. To me, I see that God's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And if I trust him, I can believe, I have to believe that I can go through my life safe, comfortable, and secure, regardless of where he puts me. Okay. You have an understanding now? You want to talk about new wine? New wine is growth. New wine is development. New wine is sharing what God's doing for you, the gifting of the Holy Spirit upon you. And I forgot to mention there's really, really good news about stepping out into the deeper part of the river. You don't need any floaties or swimmies. And that's good for me because I don't swim. Right? So you got that? You have a good context now of what I'm talking about with new wine? Now show of hands. Anybody? Okay. Take up, open your Bible, if you would, please, to John chapter 5. Give you a little bit of, like, theory. Now we look at a little practical application. All right? John 5, Jesus is at the pool of Bethesda, where he encounters a man who's had an infirmity for 38 years. 38 years is a rough approximation of how long Israel wandered in the desert, right? Long time. It also represents a generation. In essence, a lifetime. This man has been there. And the story says that an angel would come down and stir up the water, and whoever got into the water first would be relieved of whatever was bothering them. Okay? Got the context of the story if you didn't bring your Bible? We'll pick it up in verse 6. It says, When Jesus saw him lying there and knew he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? How does Jesus know he's been in that condition a long time? Because Jesus' relationship with the Father was so powerful that he understood what was going on in the context here. His Father revealed it to him, right? Had to have. And the man, the man who has no framework for any of that comes right back over here to his old way of thinking. Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. And as I am coming, another steps down before me. What zone was he in? He was in that fear zone, wasn't he? He was making an excuse. I have no man. It's an old way of thinking. And one thing I really want to point out to you is how is this man positioned? Right? Right? Think about it. I, I mean, I believe it had to be like stadium seating around this, you know, with steps down in because he said someone else steps down before him. You know, if I'm going to wait to be healed and the water's going to be stirred up, I'm going to be laying on that bottom step waiting to roll over when it happens. But he can't get there. Now, I'm assuming just by reading the story that the infirmity is from the waist down. Maybe. If he could walk, he could walk down in there, right? Maybe it's from the neck down. We don't know. But what he does is he falls back into this old way of thinking that my healing can only come in this way right here. I have to get in the water first. Very, very old thinking. And he only understands what he's experienced thus far, right? I mean, let's face it, he's not been allowed in the temple to hear anything else. It says in the Old Testament, the sick and the lame may not enter the temple. So he hasn't been allowed inside. Even the people inside, though, they've not been exposed to this new stuff that Jesus is bringing. 
they're over here. This is what we have to do. This is how it has to be. This is the way it's going to go. They have no framework for what Jesus is saying and doing, do they? I mean, I have to, give, I have to be honest. They're getting this in real time. We have the benefit of it being 2,000 years later. They haven't experienced the love and grace that Jesus carries. They haven't experienced the life-giving power that Jesus has in his hands. I say life-giving because in ancient literature, paralyzed limbs were considered dead. That's the understanding. And so Jesus is going to speak life to the whole person, isn't he? I think this story also represents the spiritual condition of Israel and not a few believers. We expect it to happen just like this, don't we? But Jesus says to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. It's just like Jesus, isn't it? To see beyond the problem, to be see beyond the excuse making, to see beyond the hesitation, and go right to the heart of the matter with you. Does he not? Of course, then the next few verses follow that the man gets in trouble because he's carrying his bed. And they question him, who, who told you, why are you carrying your bed? Oh, that guy. Right? That man... Let me make an excuse now. I'm retreating back to my past. He told me to take my bed and walk, so it's his fault. All right? That's how we do. And I love how John sets this. His whole gospel is a confrontation, is it not? It's an interrogation from start to finish. It's a courtroom scene. Bless you. See, the Jews, as he calls them, they're continuing to look to this old wine thinking. Everything has to come in this way. If it doesn't, it's not of God. They've continued to process everything through this old filter. They have all these rules to keep the people in line and under control. And that prevented them from finding and seeing the newness that's in front of them, that new wine that's been given to them. They've hoped for it. They've prayed for it. They've waited for generations to receive it. And now it's in front of them, and they reject it because it didn't come in this package. What were they expecting? A king who was going to conquer Ro the Romans, vanquish them, and then who knows? Israel goes on a rampage. I don't know what they would do. But it wasn't what they expected, so they just outright rejected it. And we don't have those kind of rules in our lives today, but you know what? So many people, so many believers are content to go through church just to do church once a week, and that's it. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's what you want. I'm going to let you know a little secret. When you've had a taste of the new wine, you can't ever go back. And that's my prayer for you, that you would not only hear that, but that you would receive it and make the pursuit of it a regular way of life. Tell them I said, hey. You know, there's a group of people that meets here on Wednesday nights, and I'm going to tell you, this, this is something that... that we just kind of take for granted in our lives when we can bump up against other believers and we can learn from them and see things happen together and we can labor and we can contend and pray together watch out it's powerful it's powerful and through a regular pursuit of jesus through worship meditation in his word and a lifestyle of faith we will see what this new wine can do within us We'll no longer live a life where we just shrug our shoulders at problems, right? This is one of the things I, I just, I tire of this. You know, I'm over here. I, you know, all my relationships are broken. Oop, you know, God's in control. I need money to fix my car. Yeah, God's in control. 
No. We need to reject that thinking outright because he's given us the keys to live life differently, not as meek little souls, but as people who know they can call on the name of Jesus. That's a powerful name, friends. And it's abnormal for a Christian not to have an appetite for the God of the impossible. I don't know how you can go through life not hungering to see the impossible things done. And the truth has been written into our spiritual DNA. We're to hunger for the impossibilities around us to bow at the name of Jesus. We say it all the time. Every tongue will confess and every knee will bow. But where do I doubt that in my own life? Hmm? We sing those words all the time. Yours is the name above all names. And that's something we need to be thoughtful of and cognizant of. Floyd and I had a, we've had the last couple days, the times we've met, it's just been amazing. Amazing what's been happening in this church. And, it, and actually, as we talk to each other, the changes we're, we've, we're seeing. You know, friends, we need to understand that we're just an ordinary people who serve an extravagant father. I said this a few weeks ago, that loving God is an incredible honor and pursuing him is our responsibility. We've been talking about this a lot lately. It's, lately. it's through our pursuit that we will begin to understand more clearly his will for our lives. And when we understand that and we can begin to walk it out, watch out. Watch out, bad guy. If you don't remember anything else from today, please remember this. We can no longer make excuses for what feels like powerlessness. Powerlessness is inexcusable. It says in 1 Corinthians 4, For the kingdom of God is not in word only, but also in power. And the power resides in the name of Jesus. You know, we don't need to have another series of sermons or classes or seminars to help us learn the step, seven steps to the nine ways to learning the four keys about how to live a life on fire. It's just not so. You can't attend one more class and expect to have it all of a sudden click. What we need is a revolution in our thinking and our vision. And we need to begin to build up spiritual muscle, just like we do physical muscle and endurance. And how do we do that? Through repetition. Through repetition. And we do it by starting one day at a time and repeating it tomorrow and the next day and the next day. You know, last Sunday after the service, Julie and I drove home. When we got home, we talked about how much we love Friends Church and how much we love what's happening here right now, what we've been experiencing together. And we did what a lot of other people do. We come right back over here and we looked at it through the prism of our previous church. Boy, if we just had this program and that program and we had this kind of worship and we had that and we had this, what a just plop, just spill it all over French church, it'd be fantastic, right? Wrong. That's old wine thinking. God's doing something different here. And we repented of that. Not that it was sinful or anything like that, but because what it did was it represented an old way of looking at God and how God was going to do it. And you have to understand, true repentance involves changing how you do things. Right? I can confess because I ate too many bonbons and I won't do it again, Lord, please you know, forgive me, blah, blah, blah. And turn around and do it again tomorrow night. And go right back, oh, Lord, I'm sorry I ate all that stuff again. And do it the next night, oh, Lord, he'll forgive me. But that's not repentance, is it? And the problem here is, in this case is, is between our ears. It's not in our hearts. Our hearts are always pointed towards Jesus. We've been trying to fit what God is doing here and now into old wineskins. What's, what's the Bible say about that in Mark? 
You can't put new wine into old wineskins because they'll burst. That's wise, isn't it? That's very, very wise. What's happening now is not that stuff. It's not that old stuff there. We were talking and laughing about there. It feels better now. It's as good now or better than when we first became believers because we were on fire. We were on fire as new believers, and now we're just so hungry for what's going on, so excited about what God's doing here that we don't want to talk about anything else. And that's a good thing, right? And I mentioned this group that's meeting on Wednesday nights, and I want to tell you something. As we ask Jesus for larger and new wineskins, you should see the wine that's being poured out on Wednesday nights. Not literally. (laughs) But that group of people right there that meet on Wednesday nights, that are learning to hear God's voice, what's, what's being experienced there is breaking. It's breaking something in this church. It's breaking off the stale stuff the crusty stuff that wasn't productive. And it's ushering in a newness because that group of people is contending for God's presence. I shared this with Floyd last week. I said, Floyd, you know, we don't talk about revival, and you can go look at all the old revivals historically. They all kind of have the same thing. God does the same stuff, and we look for God to do the exact same thing here. But what I think is happening is that group of people that are meeting on Wednesday nights are going to see God do something different. They've already seen it. They're witnessing it. And what they're doing is they are receiving it. They're taking it into their hearts. And what's going to happen is as we go out in the streets, you're going to come up and say, dude, I, you look great, man. What's happening? What is, what's different about you? Did you lost weight? People always ask me that. and It's, it's flattering, but no. What has happened to you? Man, you know, let me tell you about this, this guy I met. His name's Jesus. And, and I've been starting to listen to him, and I've been walking out what he tells me. I've been following the instructions that he gives me in my prayer time. And what's going to happen is you're going to latch on to him, and then she's going to see it and latch on over here. And pretty soon as you're out in Fred Meyer or at the you know, baseball game for your kids or soccer or something like that, do they play baseball in Fairbanks? Little League. You're out there wherever it's at, and people are seeing this on you, this newness, and they want to have it. What's going on with you? Tell me what you're doing. I'm meeting with this guy named Jesus and a group of believers that are contending for the more. That's what has to happen. We can do it individually, and we can do it corporately to contend for for the more. You know what I mean when I say contend? It says in in Matthew, the kingdom of heaven is filled with violence and the violent take it by force. If we want new wine, we pray, we contend, God, will you pour it out on me? And we begin to walk out believing that we're going to receive it. Unless and until you believe and follow the instructions that you receive in your private time, it will not happen. It requires a revolution in our thinking. And it revolves, it involves a renewing of the mind, and it's only possible through a work of the Holy Spirit. Paul says in Romans, and do not be trans- conformed, conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that which is good and acceptable will of God, perfect will of God to be precise. And that type of work happens when we're desperate. The group on Wednesday nights, they're desperate to see more of Jesus. Hmm? Is that fair? Is that a fair assessment? Desperate to see more of what God's doing. They're hungry for it. And that's what it requires, friends, a hunger. And many Christians, we repent. We repent enough to get forgiven, but we don't repent enough to see the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That means it's within our reach. It's within 
our reach. And the focus of repentance is to change our thinking until the presence of him and his righteousness fills our consciousness. It no longer becomes a reflex. Ooh, do I, should I? Mm, what will happen if? No, it's an automatic response. That what comes out of your heart's absolute love of Jesus, and you're going to be st- begin to start yielding to this over and over and over. It's going to be different. It has to be. It's new wine. Mary took a problem to Jesus and he dealt with it in an amazing way. And I believe he'll deal with what we want here as well. We want to know him more. We want to experience him in a deeper way. He'll come in. He'll come in. I mentioned the man at the pool didn't position himself very well, did he? So how do I have to position myself? How can we position ourselves to receive this new wine and to receive more of it and more of it and more of it until we're pulling it, pouring it out on those around us? Let me give you a couple of thoughts, and then we'll pray and wrap up. Is that all right? Number one, we need to change the way we see and perceive things. If you want an example, go look at John chapter 3 of what Jesus has to say to Nicodemus. And if we don't change the way we perceive things, we'll live our whole lives believing that what we see in the natural is a superior reality. Number two, live from heaven. Believing that you have victory and have a victorious mindset. You know, Jesus has overcome it all, right? You believe that? There's stuff here that I'm talking about today that might be a little bit hard to understand. Maybe a, even a bit mysterious. You may hear what Jesus says to you and sound like, Man, just, I'm really kind of confused, Jesus. I don't understand what you're asking of me. Continue to contend. Pursue it. Proverbs 25, 2 says, It's to the glory of God to conceal a matter but it's to the glory of kings to search it out. Continue to ask and seek. Number three, understand that our lives are hidden with Christ in God. And where is Jesus? Anybody? He's seated at the right hand of the Father. It says in Ephesians, Our abundant life is hidden with him. And only faith in Jesus will allow us to make withdrawals. Number four, we do this all the time. In the Lord's Prayer, we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Let's live out our lives according to his will. And how do we discover it? How do we learn what his will is for our lives? We continue to pursue him. It's pretty straightforward. We pursue him. We pursue and we hunger for the more. Does this make sense? Any of it? You want me to start over? Clarify it a little bit. This is tough. This is a tough conversation to have because we, we kind of sit on the sidelines sometimes, don't we? And I don't want to be on the sideline anymore. As, as CCR sings, put me in, coach. I'm ready to play. I want more. I watched a group of people. This is what's really awesome to me. I watched a group of people out front this morning sit there and pray and pray and ask God for blessing, ask God to solve problems, ask God to deal with the things that are hurting us where we're being held back. They had all manner of prayers 
and they were contending for God's presence and his habitation of what we're doing here. Do you understand how powerful that is? Hmm? It was a group of believers in the upper room praying in unity together, asking for the more. And it was poured out. And what happened after that's the birth of the church. It's incredible, amazing stuff, and it is available to each and every one of us. But we have to contend. We have to hunger. This didn't take as long as I thought it would. I hope I didn't hurt anybody's feelings this morning. I wanted to challenge you to pursue it because it's amazing. It's amazing, friends. The things that my wife and I have experienced when we chased after it, we've been around the globe together. And we've seen God do things that we never thought in our natural eye we would ever, ever see. And he did it. There was an instance where my wife saw a healing of a young boy who had an umbilical hernia. There was no way he was ever going to get treatment. There was no doctor to perform it. This is in Mozambique. And this little guy stands in front of her and we're all in long lines praying for people praying for the sick or just praying a blessing, whatever it was. And this little guy steps up to Julie and she's, she's in, the, in between the fear and learning zones. And she's like, well, I'm not very good at praying for people. I, don't, I need to do this with someone else. And now there's this little guy standing there in front of her with a smile on his face and she sees what's wrong with him. And all she can do is put her hand out like a mama would, right? Put her hand on his stomach she started to cry because she knew there was nothing that she could do for it there was nothing on earth that was going to solve the problem couldn't afford it and as she's crying the only word she could get out was please and that hernia receded just like that that's an amazing thing who would have thought you would ever see that with your eyes but this is the goodness and the power of God that's available to each one of us, no matter where we go. We've prayed for people here and seen things happen for them that they were just, frankly, amazed by. How would God do something like that for me? Let's stand. You know, friends, one of the things that as a church body that I think is important is we need to break something down. And that's this idea that we can't come forward to receive prayer. That my problem may be too embarrassing or I don't want people to know. I had a dream two weeks ago and I was running through a hotel lobby trying to get back to where my room was and I ran past this young woman who's standing against the fence and I can see people behind her but they're they're really not part of the story and I could hear her sobbing and she's kind of doubled over in pain and I stopped and I looked at her I said can I can I pray for you and she said yes which to me that's a big that's a big thing when someone says yes I said, what's your name? She said, Amy. Okay. And I started to pray for her. Actually, I started first. And then I stopped and asked her her name. And she said, Amy. And when I started in again, she stopped me. I, 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 this feels broken. Why are you asking me my name? And I was like, well, I, that's just what I've always done. I don't want you to know my name. You don't need to know my name. God knows your name. He knows what's wrong. You don't have to come and tell me who you are. You just say, you don't have to tell me what's going on or tell whoever would be up here to pray with you. Just ask for prayer. 
because he's waiting. He knows. I know what I'm dealing with. I've asked him for it, for healing for it, and it's happening. Slow, but I have to learn something on the way. And that's something he told to somebody else. So in this newness that he wants to invite us into, friends, we can't be afraid. We have to understand. We have to obey. As tough as that word may be to, to hear, because it sounds so religious, doesn't it? But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about being in agreement. So Jesus, as we, as we close today, Father, I just want to ask for each person here today, Lord God, that you would begin to pour out the new on them in abundance. Father, I'm praying for, for larger and newer wineskins, Lord God, that you will fill to overflowing as we move through our lives, believing and contending for the more with you. Father God, we're no longer content to just flow along in that river in a safe space. Nice, comfortable water, Lord, Lord God, we want the more. I'm tired of ho-hum ministry, Lord God. Personally, I want more. Father, I want to call in the people out there that are lost and are hurting and who are afraid to come. Let this be a place that they can come to, Father, freely and feel warm and invited and comfortable and safe. And then, Father God, give us the tools we need. Give us the words to speak that would help clean up what's been going on in their lives. Father, there are warriors here that are contending for this church. I ask you just to strengthen them. Father, usher in with them the next move you want to do. We are prayer warriors, Lord God. And Father, I want to pray for just an outpouring of the new wine for each person here as well. That you would bring about just a radical transformation of how they've experienced you. And you would give that to them in abundance and in a new way. <laughs> and Father, I just want to pray that that when that happens, that it's like Christmas morning in their hearts. You're a good God. You're an extravagant, loving God. And we worship you, and we honor you. We thank you for being here with us today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And you know, I'm going to say, say one more thing. Two things, actually. If you didn't do a Connect card, I don't get paid unless I say this twice. If you didn't do a Connect card, please fill one out and leave it, leave it back there. Floyd's going to be back there to give him, hand them out. And two, before you go home today, hang around and meet somebody you don't know. Just go say hello to somebody. You know, we keep working on this know God. We're really working hard right now on building up our knowing God muscle. But pretty soon we've got to go know each other. So go say hello to somebody. Hang around and fellowship for a minute. Coffee's on me. Amen? Have a wonderful week.